All right, everyone, welcome to this week's This and That, a coffee chat. It's just me. I have a stand-in photograph of Kelly this week. She is under the weather, so this one's going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, typically, this is where I insert uh, a clip from later in the uh, podcast where I usually crack up Kelly for some unknown reason and put that at the beginning and then... We played the intro. Well, uh, I'm doubting that the, the uh, photograph is going to do a whole lot of laughing, so we'll just go ahead and run the intro right now. Okay, so going to be a little bit shorter um, episode this week. Obviously, there's not going to be a whole lot of go- coming back and forth in the conversation, so uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, let's talk economics. Well, uh, if you remember last week, we talked about the uh, new jobs report c- that came out, and we mentioned that it was below expectations, and boy, did that rock the markets. And so uh, come uh, Friday and Monday, there was a giant sell-off in the, uh, in the old stock market. People were out saying that the Fed should do an emergency rate cut, uh, not wait till September, and then right after that, the uh, new weekly jobless claims uh, for unemployment came out, and it actually fell to two hundred and thirty-three thousand, less than expected. And then everybody kind of went, "Okay, never mind, we're good." So, uh, oh well, that is awkward. With that news, uh, as we have said for several weeks now, there's a lot of. Um, mixed messages out there and so this is just another set of mixed messages and so we'll just uh, wait and see now as a result of of both those sets of numbers the anticipated rate cut uh, where last week we were looking at 25 basis points or a quarter percent of a reduction in the Federal Reserve rate uh, the odds have shifted now to more like a half a percentage point reduction up to 57 and a half percent versus a 42 percent chance of a 25 basis point reduction so we'll keep a close eye on this i'll post the chart so that you can see that so that has already impacted some of the mortgage rates and in particular the 15-year conforming rate and i'll put this chart up has dropped significantly in the last uh, week and a half, uh, as has the 30-year rate, uh, but it's not as dramatic as the 15-year. So the markets are already starting to price in some of these reductions in the market. So if you're looking to be buying, now's a good time to have a conversation with your your lender and and see what the rates are and uh, where they may be heading over the next 30 to 60 days. So so that said, however, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta uh, came out with their National Home Ownership Affordability Monitor information through May of 2024. And it still uh, basically shows that uh, housing is very unaffordable. And one of the largest drivers of that, of course, is the interest rate. And while there have been some salary increases over the last two years, uh, they haven't been enough to offset the impact of what mortgage rates have been on the cost of home ownership. As a matter of fact, uh, the National Association of Realtors uh, put out a chart that I will share as well, that basically monthly mortgage payments on new mortgages have doubled since 2021. So the cost to buy that same house, your monthly mortgage rate has doubled since 2021. Boy, that escalated quickly. And that has certainly impacted um, the market as far as the number of people able to afford homes, the number of people still holding on to their homes because they're locked into those lower rates and are looking at to buy the same home not counting the equity that they've built up, they're looking at doubling their payment to get the same type home as they had in the past. 
So what that is leading to is an increase in overall listings on the market. Now, I know that kind of contradicts what I just said. Uh, there's still new builds going on to the market, which count as new listings, and some people just have to move life circumstances, a new job in a new city, uh, family issues, divorce, a, a death in the family, those kinds of things uh, cause people to have to put their homes on the market. So we've seen a steady increase in uh, the number of new listings and year over year, we're nearly 40% over where we were a year ago. That said, we're still below pre uh, what we call the unicorn years, those uh, pandemic years uh, on the market. So we're still not up to where we were prior to the pandemic. However, some areas, as we've mentioned in past weeks, have seen a significant increase in, the, in their inventory and they have gone above the uh, pre-pandemic levels. And most of those are in Texas and Florida. I'll put a chart up. Uh, as, a, as a nation, we're still about 30% below uh, the 2017 through 19 uh, same month average. So um, take a look at that. So what you're probably going to see is some price reductions in those areas that are ab above the 2017 through 2019 levels. And you're going to still see prices being sustained in those areas that the market's still tight on inventory. So those are all things for us to, to keep an eye on as we're moving forward um, in the coming weeks. So it'll be really interesting to see the, the level of um, Federal Reserve uh, Fed Fund rate decrease in September. If is it going to be a half a percent? What that's going to do to mortgage rates? What's the magic number that most people have in their, their mind where they're going to say, okay, I'm ready to jump back into the market, put my home on the market, and then see what that does with the supply and demand. Here's to apply supply and demand analysis moving forward. Will the sellers jump in quicker than the buyers or will the buyers jump in quicker than the sellers or will it be an equal and balanced um, uptick on both sides? If it's equal and balanced, you're not going to see a lot of change in prices. If you see one side exceeding the other, that could have a fairly interesting impact on home prices in the short term. I think over time, that will balance out. So you have um, competing factors there. So if buyers jump in first, that's going to drive up home prices. Might drive up home prices to the point that homeowners will feel that they have enough equity in their, their home that they can go ahead and put it on the market and take that additional equity and basically buy down the price of their, their next mortgage, even with the higher interest rates. Conversely, if if sellers hop into the market, that's going to have a downward drag on pricing that might entice home buyers with the lower interest rates to also jump in. So there might be a short term, and I would say three to six month adjustment period, unless both parties enter at the same time with the same velocity. So don't think if you see a downward trend in your area, that's necessarily going to be a long term one. Likewise, if you see home prices increase, I also don't see that as a long-term uh, trend. Right now, we're looking at about a 5% increase year over year in home prices at the national level. So home prices have continued to go up in spite of the low sales volume that has been going on around the country. Kelly, you have anything? Oh, never mind. Okay, so enough economics, enough uh, real estate. Just have a couple items I wanted to talk about from the sports world. Um, Kelly has more items, but uh, we'll have to save those for next week and we'll save some of our pop culture stuff uh, for next week as well so we can have a conversation about that. But I uh, have to tip my hat to Scotty Scheffler winning the Olympic gold medal in golf 
by shooting an outstanding 62 in his final round to, to claim the gold as some of the other players at the top of the leaderboard were imploding, especially towards the end of the rounds, John Rahm uh, being one of them. Uh, Scotty just showed why he's the number one player in the world right now and put on a real show. I know Kelly would like to talk a little bit about some of the gymnastics stuff um, and there's some controversies that just occurred today as we're filming this as potentially a bronze medal from one of the um, U.S. Olympians may be taken away on uh, their, their points protest uh, came in after the one minute deadline. So uh, we'll see how that all turns out and maybe talk about it some more next week. The other thing, and F1 fans hang in there with me, um, I'm, I'm going to talk NASCAR here for a minute, but uh, this is something that's a little bit interesting that's going on in the NASCAR world. And um, right now, uh, NASCAR is renegotiating with the team owners the charter system. Now, think of the charter system in Formula One kind of like the Concord Agreement that the teams and the FIA have together. So NASCAR instituted the charter system, I think about five years ago, and it, it guarantees 40 spots in every race for the teams that own charters. No team can own more than four charters, I believe is the number. And basically out of thin air, they have created value for the teams because charters are now selling for about $40 million each. So as NASCAR has uh, negotiated a new TV contract, uh, they're having new negotiations on the charter and what kind of prize money is going to be guaranteed for each team that has a charter and so on and so forth. Now, what is interesting is it has been reported that NASCAR, it, during these discussions, is talking about preventing uh, sovereign entities from purchasing charters. So, like Newcastle United in soccer is owned by a public investment fund out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, other sports have been impacted by these sovereign funds. Uh, probably the biggest is the PGA with the creation of the Live Tour and direct competition and poaching of players uh, from the PGA. And if uh, the merger, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, doesn't get resolved soon, you're going to probably end up with something very similar to what happened to IndyCar when the uh, championship auto racing teams, CART and uh, USAC split into two different series. And basically IndyCar has never been the same since. So it's interesting that NASCAR is putting their foot down, not officially yet, but at least in negotiations, and basically going to prohibit any um, sovereign entities from investing in buying charters at NASCAR. So what's to prevent a sovereign entity from creating another series in the United States? Well, that's where uh, the France family comes in, who owns and controls NASCAR, and also owns and controls half of the, or two thirds of the major tracks that NASCAR runs at through the International Speedway Corporation. Um, and then the other entities that own the major tracks that are run in a NASCAR is Speedway Motorsports, owns tracks like Texas Motor Speedway, Charlotte Motor Speedway, New Hampshire, North Wilkesboro, and then Roger Penske owns Indianapolis. So those three groups control all the major racetracks in the United States. And unless one of them, more than likely that'd be uh, Speedway Motorsports, wants to break away from the family, um, there's not a chance that you're going to have a successful series start and compete against NASCAR in the United States because the major venues are controlled by NASCAR and their associates. And I don't see Speedway Motorsports ever wanting to uh, take the chance of, um, let's just say, disappointing the France family because they will probably never ever get back into NASCAR if they do something like that. So 
an interesting place, an interesting um, stance. It'll be uh, fun to follow to see how all this works out and whether or not um, some of the teams are going to object to this. There's a lot of discussion right now that you have private equity firms looking to buy into NASCAR charters because they have had great returns in their sports investments in the NFL, Major League Baseball, soccer around the world, that those have all become very expensive. And so they're looking for the next low priced place to jump into the market. And at $40 million a charter uh, for, for a car, that's a pretty cheap investment. And if over a five year period, you could double or uh, maybe even triple that investment is the, if the sport grows, as a lot of the private equity firms uh, feel it could, then uh, you're going to have a very interesting situation going forward in NASCAR with private equity entering the game. So with that, uh, what do I have to look forward to? Her feeling better. Get better, get well, hope you're feeling much better soon. So that we can... <laughs> We'll work on that and then um, I have been I'm really late to the game on this one I just recently watched the uh, first two Jack Reacher movies uh, starring Tom Cruise and so I've now started streaming the Reacher series on Amazon so in the comments below let me know if that's a series that you enjoy and have watched and what other items during the heat of summer here in Tucson should I be binge watching. Let us know. Thank you much and we'll see you next week.